Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to share some of the work we're doing. I, um, what I hope to do in my time uh, is, to, is to really provide, in some sense, a proof of concept to what Craig just described, which is the work that we've been doing over the course of the last decade or so. I think it's very clear, everybody knows, race to the top, I3, other policies at district and state levels are targeting measurement and improvement of teacher quality as a major goal. Um, and we all agree that professional development is kind of a critical pathway toward achieving performance goals. But I think, right, you know, uh, don't have to echo Craig's points anymore, but there's really very little evidence that PD um, uh, improves performance. And in fact, um, for our data and others show that uh, getting a good teacher is really a matter of luck. So the question is, you know, in a very complex system where you've got resources moving in of all sorts, moving in one side, um, you've got a certification and licensure system that sits somewhat in parallel to, um, to districts and, and uh, teacher preparation programs. You've got uh, classroom performance on the other hand, and you've got student learning and development. All those moving parts. Um, uh, our argument, and I think uh, many would make the same case, is that there's just simply too few metrics for the key markers in that complicated system. And if we were approaching this as engineers, we'd look at this and we'd say a lot of sy system with a lot of moving parts, we would try to find key markers in each one of those and deal with the couplings that exist across those because it's really, as I hope to uh, point out, it's in those markers and the couplings across those markers that we can really, um, uh, I think, achieve some leverage and traction. Um, so we're going to talk quite a bit about this uh, so, sort of alignment between uh, metrics of teaching and learning in, uh, in what I think is kind of a proof of concept. So we've tackled this really from the scientific study of, of teaching and learning, the measurement and production of effective teaching. We are improvers. I actually bet Rick Hanushek in a meeting, uh, my retirement uh, fund, that you could actually improve teaching. Um, so I, I have to collect on that bet, I guess, now. Um, so the, the approach is really, uh, from the measurement standpoint, to improve what teachers do that links to learning and, de and, and development. So look at what teachers are actually doing um, in classrooms. How are kids experiencing teachers' uh, effectiveness? Prove that what you're observing really does indeed matter for achievement. That's that issue of coupling. We could observe all day, but if obser observation isn't coupled with achievement, we're going to waste a lot of energy. Uh, and then uh, try to replicate that because the other, de the other issue that we have to deal with here is scale. So can we, uh, can we do this in many thousands of classrooms? We've been doing this on the measurement side with the classroom assessment scoring system, as, as Cindy mentioned. Um, and, then, and then the issue is how do we engineer a set of supports around the behaviors that we've observed that we've been able to show relate to achievement that actually move um, teachers' behaviors in classrooms in the, much the way that Craig uh, described that cascade, move the behaviors, move, the achievement should move uh, along that uh, line. And we're going to talk about these uh, approaches that we've, um, we've tested and I think are achieving some level of traction. So we, we look at teacher-child interactions, they matter, um, and we look at them in three very broad domains conceptually, and then this is just the sort of pre-K to five version of the classroom assessment scoring system with those domains running down the left side, or the right side, excuse me, and then ratings that are done of teachers' behaviors with kids um, uh, on a one to seven scale along those dimensions running down um, the left side. Um, we've used this um, in in reliable ways. I want to point out reliability because we pay a lot of attention to quality control. Again, this is a point that Craig raised. Um, uh, implementing these sort of protocols require a lot of attention to quality control. In many thousands of classrooms across the uh, country, it's actually um, been rolled out in Head Start nationally, uh, which is a very noisy system to run out a, 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 uh, run a standardized uh, assessment through. Um, we've shown in many of these uh, studies that uh, in, in uh, looking at kids pre-post uh, scores on any number of standardized achievements at uh, all sorts of grade levels, um, that the, when we assign higher scores to teachers on the class, um, that the kids are learning more in those uh, classrooms. Those are largely quasi-experimental studies with lots of information about teachers and kids and uh, family background controlled. And we're able to show um, that the riskier kids basically are benefiting from higher, more effective teachers um, and the order of about half of the achievement gap. But um, the kicker is that classrooms really don't function in the ways that are gap-closing classrooms. And we see just on the basis of this graph here shows uh, histograms, smooth histograms of one to seven, one on the left, seven on the right. You see the blue bump is instructional support. And I'm not going to go into this uh, uh, in great detail, but that's really the level of cognitive demand that's expressed in the teacher's interactions with kids in the classrooms. And we see those are very, very low. We've been able to show that if you can move that bump, 
uh, above what is a fundamentally an average of a two rating on a one to seven scale into a three, that the classroom becomes more uh, cognitive and all of a sudden um, uh, you see an association between teachers' behaviors and kids' learning gains. So our question then has been to be, how do we uh, observe uh, uh, behavior that matters for learning and then, as I said, engineer and test these, um, these um, features uh, in professional development with the behavior of teachers as kind of the starting point. We paid a lot of attention to the point that, um, that Craig uh, has, has uh, pointed out, which is really the issue of mechanism. Okay, so that is, if we're uh, observing a particular behavior, and we are going to assign a teacher to some form of professional development, have we articulated the actual reason why we think that professional development is going to impact that behavior? And is that, art is that articulation detailed enough and, and, and coherent enough and have some at least face validity, uh, if not, uh, as, as I hope to point out, some empirical validity? So we've done this. Um, with class as the, me as the mechanism or the, or the point of uh, the target, if you will, for teachers' behavior, with a video library under the hypothesis essentially that says um, viewing others' effective teaching is a way to create models for effective teaching in your own head that can guide your behavior in the classroom, um, and then uh, a coaching model that allows a uh, scaffolded uh, analysis of teachers' own behavior in the classroom under the, uh, a very kind of standardized process. And we've also built these uh, concepts and skills back into a uh, course that we've delivered in higher education to sort of demonstrate whether that's uh, actually possible. Um, all of these, <laughs> it's nice to say that as a dean of a school of education. Um, all of these are tested, uh, have been tested in randomized control trials. So I think that's the other, the other point to emphasize. This is just an example of the video library, but I want to point out here that this would be a clip that somebody would see of what a concept we call regard for adolescence perspective. If you're teaching second, uh, secondary schools. And the, the, the text that goes along with that, the annotated text, is at a great deal of detail and granularity about the moment-to-moment -moment behavior that occurs in that clip about a minute and a half. It is not at a 30,000-foot level. It's at gr the ground floor. And I think that's a point that, that um, we're beginning to learn and the work that we're doing is, re is really important. This is an interface that a teacher would see if she was being coached, uh, where we sh she would see a clip of herself uh, giving a lesson, uh, comments from the coach about that lesson, and she would have the opportunity to fill in on the bottom her own comments in a cycle that repeats itself uh, roughly eight to 10 times over the course of the year. That's our coaching um, model. Okay, when we've evaluated this in RCTs, um, uh, one set uh, done in, with two um, RCTs done with uh, pre-K teachers, about 700 teachers, uh, 15 sites with our coaches. We find uh, impacts on interactions in the classroom with effect sizes that range from about 0.5 to 1. Um, so, so the coaching is dosing um, uh, in, in a way that, that's moving teachers' um, behavior in the classroom. Um, the cost, if we've costed this out, if it was individualized coaching, we can talk about this later in the Q&A, it costs about $2,500 a, te uh, a teacher, which actually, if you look at Alan Auden's analysis, is at the lower end of the uh, annual cost of PD per teacher. Um, the PK kids who had teachers who were coached uh, showed uh, considerably greater gains, uh, about half the achievement gap in, in literacy, um, much greater scores on attention and, and uh, learning activities, and lower levels of problem behavior. They essentially came to school more school ready. We just replicated this study. Uh, Craig uh, referred to this. It's published in Science this uh, in August. The same approach in secondary schools um, across all uh, content areas. I want to uh, make a point of this so that these teachers were, uh, came across four, four major content um, areas in 6th to 11th grade. Um, impacts on teachers' behavior with kids and students' engagement that were of the order that we were seeing in the pre-K study. And then the average kid who had a teacher who was being coached bumped 10 percentile points on the, this is the Virginia State Standards of Learning um, test. That, that bump occurred all across all content areas. So there was no interaction between, um, between the, uh, the gains and content. It occurred in math and science as much as occurred in history and language arts. When we roll that cost out on a per student basis, we're looking at roughly about $200 a student um, if you uh, counted all the students that a given teacher taught um, and, and estimated the costs. 
I mentioned this issue about uh, the, this goal to also look at the degree to which uh, higher ed can be a, a, a lever for change uh, and improvement. So we talked mostly up to this point about professional development on an in-service basis. So let's think about a pre-service kind of context in which teachers um, are, are given, um, are um, developed a course that was really focused on what we hypothesized were a set of knowledge about interactions and skills that teachers needed to be able to observe their own interactions in the classroom. So we tried to train them in knowledge and skills, very much like taking a reliability test on scoring you know, the, um, the observation frame with, with class. We randomly assigned um, um, uh, students into uh, courses um, or a uh, business as usual course at 15 different higher ed sites across the country. So we also had the opportunity to see if you could get 15 different higher ed instructors to teach a course in the same way. Um, and you see the effect sizes there on uh, the, precisely those elements of interaction that were in the blue bump, right, that we wanted to move to the right back in the, in the descriptive um, uh, results earlier. So we think we're seeing some, um, some leverage here. And again, I want to offer this uh, not as sort of the, the only way to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm offering this as a proof of concept of a lot of different models that are now starting to roll out. So that if we did this, it, the best of all worlds would be if we did this and had this talk, uh, this session in five years, Craig wouldn't be up here saying that only nine studies were able to demonstrate some impact of professional development on, on teachers, lear uh, teachers learning and kids learning. So we think this is, uh, class is one of a few scalable and standardized way to quantify teacher impact. I want to point out that, um, at least as we uh, look at this, we should be thinking about observation uh, of teachers' performance in classroom, not using the word rubric, um, quite frankly, because I think that diminishes the precision with which those instruments have to be deployed, which should be the same level of precision, the same level of technical strength, as the out achievement assessments are, uh, are for kids as well. So we should, tr we should really be looking um, at these approaches and protocols as, as standardized measures. Uh, our work has been to observe to improve, and we've been able to show that when you couple um, professional development that we think is uh, at least hypothetically aligned to teacher behavior, teacher behavior moves. Okay, that, that we're, we're seeing that as has others. Um, we're wrestling with this question of how cost effective it is to, to do this. Um, our argument in part um, is that scale eventually produces efficiencies and we can imagine ways in which we start to build ways of scaling that do intentionally produce those efficiencies. The Gates Met study is one of the major studies that's helping um, all that move forward. The other point about scale is that districts now spend a ton of money on ineffective PD. Um, and so uh, the, the issue on, you know, when we think about scale as a resource question, there's a lot of resources sitting there that potentially could be redeployed um, or rede uh, redirected. And in fact, I think a lot of the issue with scale um, uh, turns on the question of not adding something onto the workforce, but training the workforce um, available and the resources available to implement protocols in a fairly standardized uh, way and with some level of fidelity. Um, Business and engineering does this all the time. Uh, we seem to have a hard time with that. Um, so implications for policy, I think, you know, metrics and protocols matter. I think uh, standardized, reliable, and uh, valid protocols are very important, and I think we have to be very careful right now as Race to the Top rolls out, as I3 rolls out. I'm not convinced that the evidence base of a lot of the components of those um, larger, uh, larger um, uh, initiatives and the rapid ramp up that's required for moving them forward uh, is necessarily going to produce the kind of change that we, uh, we would like. And then the invention of local protocols without attention to technical adequacy are, is also a real concern. I think we could begin to think of an, a world in which state certification systems and teacher preparation can be overhauled. Um, we can begin to think about credentialing teachers who demonstrate performance rather than credentialing teachers on the basis of, of acquired seat time. Build some of these, uh, what we're learning about effective PD from the uh, in-service world back into the pre-service world. The course that I uh, talked about is just one example of that. We could imagine coaching models that are the coaching models used in supervision of student teaching, right? Um, and then I think we can begin to think about program accreditation um, as in part um, based upon um, the extent to which that teacher preparation program is actually using evidence-based models of training 
not just what we're doing now, which I think is more along the lines of, is there some evidence that you're doing something that works, which is a nice step. I think NK and, and, and others have done, and TIAC have done a nice job of that. But the next step is really, okay, um, are you using models that actually for which there is some, um, some harder evidence? And then finally, this issue of aligned PD. I think there are ways to engineer. Uh, I think this is more of an engineering problem than not, although it has a political dimension to it, um, how we intersect the moving and improving, how we intersect accountability with improvement, um, whether that's uh, something like pay for per performance that's based on what teachers do in the classroom. Certainly think about ways, that, uh, echoing Craig, that we can require I would say require, I'd push that word a little harder, um, that funds be spent on proven effective models. So I think uh, particularly in a world where funds are very, very tight. Um, and in the end of the day, I think if we uh, tended to some of these things, we'd end up uh, building better teachers. Thanks very much.